In 1966, my band Chain Reaction opened for the Yardbirds at Staples High School in Westport, Connecticut. We all carried our equipment into the hall together. As I recall, I dragged a couple of Jimmy Page's amps as well. So I was a roadie for the Yardbirds. Or at least that's how the press took it at the time. I told this story. Anyway, it was the first time I ever heard him play, and it hit me like a heat wave. Three years later, in 1969, I saw Led Zeppelin perform at the Boston Tea Party. They ran out of songs after they played their whole first album, so they had to do a bunch of Elvis tunes because we wouldn't let them get off stage. I just sat cross-legged in the back of the room while they played the middle section of Dazed and Confused, and it was so fucking heavy that it made me cry. Another time I cried over Led Zeppelin was an hour later when Jimmy Page emerged from the dressing room with a beautiful girl in his arm. I would have been very impressed, except it was the girl I'd been living with up until that moment. <laughs> and I was getting an incredible, incredible visual of all my clothes being thrown out into the alley on 21st Street. But Jimmy was such a motherfucker on stage, I couldn't hold it against him. Anywho, about the same time, there was this guy called Henry Smith, who was my neighbor in Sunapee. New Hampshire. I was a drummer back then, and he was my drum roadie. He was a good friend. He even cut the sleeves off his grandmother's fur coat so I could have something stupid to wear on stage. <laughs> well, Henry's the one that got us the gig with the Yardbirds, and all went well until one day he comes up to me and he just quits. I got a gig with Zeppelin, he says. I was devastated. Who was going to set up my drums at Murray's Clam Shack at the Brattleboro, Vermont? <laughs> But once I got over the jealousy, I got really excited because I knew somebody who was going to work with Led Zeppelin. That was the equivalent of going to the moon with Neil Armstrong in an Apollo capsule full of babes. <laughs> and, and I knew I'd have enough cymbals and drumsticks for the next three years. Eventually, Henry the Horse, as Jimmy and Robert affectionately called him, introduced me to the band. On the first occasion, I got to sit at Bonzo's drum kit at Electric Ladyland Studios. I could feel the power even without him physically being there. Later, we went over to a sound check at Madison Square Garden. When I got there, the road crew and the union people were all eating, and the band hadn't arrived yet. The stage was empty, and so were the 19,000 seats. The audience, the silence, was deafening. I walked out to the stage. I laid down, my head hanging backwards off the edge. I was overwhelmed. I was having delirious delusions of rock and roll grandeur, imagining that I was roaming the countryside, raping and pillaging, disguised as an ambassador of rock and roll. And that's just one of the things we learned from Led Zeppelin. <laughs> so here we are. I'm still hanging off the edge of the stage. Now we get to induct Led Zeppelin into the Hall of Fame. Life was pretty good, huh, Joe? Yeah. Uh... Now, everything you ever heard about Led Zeppelin was true. They were like Lord Byron, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. They mixed Celtic riffs with the blues and spiced it up with Indian and Arabic modes. It was pure chemistry, kind of like Holland Wolf meets the Loch Ness Monster. No way was it for the faint of heart. Led Zeppelin was the real deal, and it took like Mohammed in the desert. They were even big in Vietnam, where the troops bolted eight-track players onto their personnel carriers and went into battle broadcasting a whole lot of love. What I loved about Led Zeppelin, besides communication breakdown, the song remains the same, Cashmere, No Quarter, and the Rain Song, and about a hundred other songs, was that they didn't take themselves all that seriously. They had a no-bullshit mentality and no compunctions about using the blues as a way of catapulting their music into Caledonia's, Caledonia's damp knickers. And uh, they were simply the best musicians going. You could put Jimmy Page up against any guitarist in the world. Same with Bonzo on the drums and Zeppelin's unsung hero, John Paul B Jones, on bass, keyboards, and orchestrations. His musicianship and classical slant on things gave Zeppelin an added dimension that constantly kept them in, the, in a class of their own. And then there was Robert Plant. He came to the first New Yardbirds band rehearsal in South London straight from his 
job building roads. He had tar in his hands and tar in his hair, and when he opened his mouth, it was like a fucking air raid siren going off. Keith Moon told him it would go over like a Led Zeppelin. For the next 12 years, they reigned as undisputed wor world champions of rock, set an unattainable standard of music and mystique for those of us who tried to follow them. Okay, whom the gods love, die young. We can't let this moment go now without talking about Bonzo, because he's one of the most important reasons we're here tonight. John Henry Bonham, before he came along, all the great English drummers, Ringo, Charlie Watts, Keith Moon, were short, tempered. But John was big, radically big, and had an attack that was like bombs away, baby. And even when he threw the sticks away and played with his hands, you noticed that the volume didn't go down. He had great feel, great drive, and an incredible combination of soul and technique. To everyone else in his band, he was a warm, funny, he was warm and funny, loved his family and farm, but did not like to tour. As Robert once put it, John often got swamped by the absolute remoteness inside the fish tank, the fish bowl. These were the days before anyone knew how to handle the shadow side of our business, like too many master musicians before. And since he left us before his time, Bonzo ruled, he still rules, even today, no one can take his place. In many ways, he was the lead in Zeppelin, and perhaps the most fitting tribute to him is that after his death, his old band called it quits. I just want to say a couple of things about what Zeppelin means to me. Um, I love this band because they had no limits. They weren't musical snobs and never held on to anyone's style. Zeppelin would change gears six times on one album. They played blues, funk, rock, reggae, and ballads with equal ease. I think it's laughable that some people still consider them just a heavy metal band, since at least half of their best songs are acoustic. They were doing Unplugged long before it was the hip thing to do. I learned a lot from Jimmy Page. The best lesson was don't be afraid to play any instrument, stringed or otherwise. He played slide guitar, electric, acoustic, 12-string, bass, mandolin, sitar, and dulcimer. He invented strange tunings, whatever it took to create the mood. So, uh, Jimmy, when are you going to show me how to play the rain song? Maybe after? So I know for Stephen and the rest of our band, when I say that Aerosmith wouldn't exist in its present form without Led Zeppelin's continuing inspiration. A few months ago, when I was having lunch with Jimmy Page in uh, Buenos Aires, he asked me to do this tonight, and I felt like I was the one being honored. So right now, I want to tell John Bonham, John Paul Jones, Robert Plant, and Jimmy Page that we and millions of their fans all over the world hold them in the highest esteem. It's an incredible honor for me to say to them, welcome to the Hall of Fame.